Good morning and welcome to Virtual Grace on this ninth Sunday, I think, tenth Sunday of Pentecost. It is summer, it's time to get out in boats, and last weekend I was in a kayak fishing, um, but today we will hear about a terrifying boat trip the disciples took. Just keep in mind that not all boat trips involve beer drinking and Jimmy Buffett music, so stay <laughs> tuned. Oh. And we should begin at the beginning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Oh. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. pray grant us Lord we pray the spirit to think and do always those things that are right that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God now and forever Amen. Amen. The first lesson is from the book of Genesis. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flocks with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, the father's wives, and Joseph brought <coughs> a bad report to, uh, to them, of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are your 
Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem and found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dotham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dotham. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with the sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and lay not our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. We will read Psalms 105 responsively by half verse. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. And speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, his servant. O children, children of Jacob, Jacob his chosen. chosen. Then he called for a famine in the land and, and destroyed the supply of bread. bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, Joseph who was sold as a slave. slave. They bruised his feet in fetters. His, his neck they put in an iron collar until his prediction came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. him. O king sent <coughs> and released him. The ruler of the people sent him free. He set him as a master over his household as a ruler, ruler over all his possessions, possessions, to instruct his princes according to his will, and to, and to teach, teach his elders wisdom. Hallelujah. This is a reading from the Book of Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, the same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent. And it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Alleluia, alleluia. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in them the fire of your love. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. In the name of God who gives us time and options to get in boats. Amen. Many of you probably know that my first career as a scientist pretty much compels me to look at whatever evidence I can find in any situation. So let's consider some facts about the story we just heard. First, we need to travel together all the way back to the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is Lake Kinneret in Hebrew, in the year 1986. The lake in that year was at an all-time low in elevation due to a prolonged drought. And two Israeli brothers, Moshe and Yuval Lufan, fished Kinneret for their livelihood. But now they had to walk way out through the mud just to get to their boat. They searched the hills around the northwest shore for artifacts, as many rural Israelis did, turning them over to the Antiquities Commission. But they considered themselves amateur archaeologists. And that particular day, one of them stubbed his toe in the mud. Now, there were no rocks in this area, so that was an unusual thing. And a little bit of hand digging revealed a curved piece of wood. A bit more digging found several other curved pieces, each the same distance apart. Could they be the ribs of an ancient boat buried in the mud, they wondered. Well, it was a boat, preserved in the mud and radiocarbon dated to the year 40, plus or minus 80 years. We don't know if it was the exact boat that Jesus took with the disciples on that day, but we do know that it was very typical of boats on the Kerret in that period. 
No larger boats have ever been found, nor historical records pointing to larger boats working on the lake. The shoreline would just not permit a larger, deeper draft boat, and besides, wood in that area was scarce. The Jesus boat, now on display at Kibbutz Ginnasar, was made from 10 different types of wood. The boat could be used for fishing or passengers. It was shallow draft, so it could get close to the shore on the large, shallow flats of the northern shore in Galilee. The boat measured 27 feet in length at a relatively broad beam of seven and a half feet wide. It was twice as long and about three times as wide as my two-person canoe. Now that boat had four staggered rowers, two on each side. It had a single center mast with an estimated sail area of 10 to 12 square yards. The story tells us that Jesus compelled his disciples to get in the boat right after he fed the 5,000 men plus women and children. Even if four disciples took the place of four burly rowers on that boat, there is no way, no physical way you could cram 12 disciples on that boat. Were there two boats? Why leave out that detail? And if there were two, they surely would have dropped their mast and lashed the boats together in a storm. It is most likely that there was only one boat, and not all the disciples could fit on board. Some walked around the northern shore to the other side. Could there be a simple lesson here? When Jesus compels us to do something, there may not be room for everyone. Some of us may have to walk, and that could even be a good thing, especially if you don't like water. The logistics of the trip are challenging too, Kinneret is only six miles across. You can see Tiberia, or Tiberius, on the western shore, standing on the deserted eastern shore. Easterly winds do come up fast in the spring when the land mass from the Jordanian desert heats up faster than the Mediterranean Sea. Many swimmers have drowned in modern-day Israel from those easterly winds. On a normal day in a first-century boat like this, you could cross the lake in two hours. If they set out at sundown in the spring and assuming there was no visible storm blowing in from the east when they launched, they would have been in the middle of the lake by 10 p.m. or sooner. The gospel tells us that Jesus comes walking to them in the middle of the lake during a storm on the fourth watch. That would be between 3 and 6 a.m. That means they spent five hours halfway or closer to the opposite shore, just staying in one place against the wind. Why wouldn't they let themselves just be blown back to their point of embarkment? Were they just stubborn or determined to carry out Jesus' command above all else? The military has a term for this kind of determination. They say that someone is hell-bent to complete their mission. As you know from an earlier story about our honeymoon, Joan and I know firsthand what it's like to be out in the middle of a six-mile lake crossing when a storm blows in. Waves crash over the side of the boat. The boat disappears in the trough of the waves, and all you can see around you are, is a wall of water on all sides. The exertion of paddling or rowing is spurred on by the rush of fear-induced adrenaline. You feel tiny, helpless, insignificant against the chaos of the water around you. But when Jesus sends you on a mission, you are not hell-bent. You are Jesus-bent. Ministry is like that. You are Jesus-bent. When Jesus compels you to do something, there is absolutely nothing that will stand in your way. You might go down with the boat. You might lose your life. You might be injured for life. You might see Jesus coming to you on the water and think you're hallucinating. You might imagine that you're dying. And in a sense, your imagination would be correct. The church observes the sacrament of baptism as a one-time event. You die to your old self and rise again from the waters to a new life in Christ, a life you have pledged to love your neighbors as your, and your enemies as much as you love yourself. But what if 
Jesus baptizes us time and time again in that act of compulsion. He compels us to advocate for the poor. He compels us to prepare and deliver meals to people. He compels us to give out boxes of food. He compels us to sit with and teach our children patiently. He compels us to visit others when there is no pandemic and to bring the love of Christ to everyone. He compels us to respect the freedom and dignity of all human beings. All these acts of compassion form us. We are Jesus bent. Once we say, yes, Jesus, there is nothing that will stand in our way. Above all, Christians should be known for being stubborn and determined to carry out the things they're called to do. Now there's another act of compulsion we often overlook. We are often compelled to go places and do things that we would choose otherwise not to do. No one asked the terrified disciples that night if they were happy with their ministry. No one asked Mother Teresa or Mary, the mother of Jesus, if they were happy with their lives. Asking clergy or anyone serious about the ministries they've been called to do, if they're happy with things, is to ask the wrong question. That is a human perspective and not a godly one. Ask a person who is compelled in their ministry or if they're Jesus bent, whether they are fulfilled, whether they feel they're doing the right thing, whether they pray that Jesus might help them redeem the situation if it seems to go bad, whether they are called to do what they are doing. Those are the questions you ask someone who is Jesus bent. The small boat was filled with precious human passengers headed due east into the darkness of a fierce storm. The waves rolled straight at them and crashed over that pointed bow. The wooden hull had been repaired many times. It creaked and groaned under the strain. Everyone on board was filled with terror. After living on the road with the Savior for a year or so, each person was uttering a prayer in their heart for Yeshua to save them from that, to calm the storm, just like the last time. The sides of the boat are called gunnels. The boat's gunnels were over four feet high. In flat water, with a normal load, the distance from the wa water to the top of the gunnel was over two feet. That's why those boats were so stable, even in a storm. But they were difficult to get into and out of in a normal situation on concrete. Most people would have difficulty stepping up two feet. I don't think Peter was the only one who stepped out of the boat that night. I think they were all going down. I envision this as the primary source for baptism. Jesus reached down and pulled them all out of death's dark shadows. I imagine Jesus beaming with pride as he looked down on the waterlogged boat. Over the sound and fury of the storm, he smiles and tells them, you did what I asked you to do. Later, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus will tell the parable of the Ten Talents. The story ends with this quote. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master.
Let us stand and profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in, in one God, God the Father, Father the Almighty, the maker, maker of heaven, heaven and earth, earth of all, all that, that is seen, seen and unseen. We believe, we believe in one, one Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ the, the only Son, Son of God, God eternally, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, from light true God from true God, God begotten, not made, of one, one being with the Father, with the Father through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down, he came down from, from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe, we believe in the Holy Spirit, Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. the prayers of the people. As we have offered gratitude for God's grace upon this community, let us now offer our gifts to the Lord, trusting that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be led to ever more faithful fellowship and service. We pray for peace from things that separate us from one another and for our salvation. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the holy churches of God, especially St. John's, John's, Tulsa, St. Simeon's, Saint Simeon's home, home, Tulsa, the Diocese Saint of New Mexico, Mexico and the Episcopal Church of South Sudan. For this holy gathering and those who enter with faith, reverence, and fear of God, Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding Saint bishop, bishop, Ed, Ed our, our bishop, bishop Paulson, Paulson, our bishop, bishop co-adjutor, Bob, Bob and Tom, our, our clergy, Tim, Tim and Jennifer, Jennifer our wardens, Vestry, Vestry delegates, delegates, and all who minister in Christ, and for, for all, all the holy, holy people, people of God, God Lord, Lord, have mercy. mercy. For the world and its leaders, our nation and its peoples, we pray for our leaders, especially Donald, Donald our, our president, president, Mike, our vice president, president Mark, Mark Wayne, Wayne, our congressman, James, James and Jim, our senators, senators Kevin, Kevin, our governor, and Marlon, Marlon our mayor, Lord, Lord have mercy. For prisoners, the oppressed, and all those in need or suffering, especially Barbara and family, family the Blackwell family, family, Brad, the Brewer, Brewer family, James, James and Shirley, Judy, Judy Sherry, B, Ethan, Ethan, Linda, John, Vicki, Angie, Vicky, Blair, Blair, Brian, Glenn, Glenn all those affected by the pandemic, and, and those whose suffering is known only to God. God. We pray for those in the armed services, and we pray for those who have died, especially our beloved Tom Alford. Lord, 
Lord, have mercy. For ourselves, our families, and those we love, we pray for those in our parish especially, Kirsty, Madison, Madison, Maisie, Maisie, and Trenton, and for those who are traveling, Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Bless all those everywhere who give themselves to the service of others, that with wisdom, patience, and courage, they may minister to the suffering, the friendless, and the needy, for love of him who laid down his life for us. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. Remembering our most blessed Mary and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To Indeed. you, O Lord. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer for healing of the world. God of mercy and grace, you have called us from the east and from the west, from the south and from the north, to be your body in this world. Keep us connected and you even in our physical distance. We, we come, come to you trusting, trusting that you are our refuge and our strength, our very present help in trouble. We pray for people, people who are experiencing are symptoms, symptoms of COVID-19 and for the family and medical staff who surround them in care. care. We pray, we pray for, for those who are most vulnerable to this disease, whether from underlying health conditions or other contributing factors. May they rest in your peace and protection. And protection. We pray, we pray for, for health care workers, workers and people on the front lines of this disease, for workers who are in essential roles to keep our communities going, keep them healthy, keep them safe. We pray for parents and children who are struggling with this new normal of homeschool, especially those who rely on school meal programs. We pray for everyone struggling with these rapid changes. May we be comforted by your peace and presence. your presence. We pray, we pray for people who face hate and discrimination brought on by fear and anger. May these, your beloved children, feel your embrace. We pray for those whose actions are motivated by fear and anger. May they remember that you are God of abundance. We pray for our leaders. May they be guided by your wisdom. May they be courageous and make the bold decisions necessary to end this pandemic. And we pray for all the advocates and volunteers who are responding to your call to care for the people who are most vulnerable in our communities and around the world. Give them endurance. Stir them with your longing for justice. May they be comforted and moved by your Holy Spirit. In the strong name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly, and we humbly repent. repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, and also with you. Peace. Good job reading. Peace. Namaste. <laughs> peace. Peace. Bonk. Thank you, ladies. Peace to everyone. Peace. I just have one. You have one announcement. Go yes. for it. Uh, this week, the... Uh, we did not have a food truck here at Grace this week, uh, but next Tuesday at 10 o'clock, there will be uh, in the Antioch Grace parking lot, uh, Antioch will be hosting 
for the month of August. And so please come and pick up Great. boxes if you need food boxes or if come and help. Come help hand out boxes. And my announcement is please join us for virtual coffee hour. It's been a little sparse lately, but um, uh, get in on that Zoom uh, virtual connection that's advertised at the end of the bulletin, the end of the service. And we'd love to um, have some coffee or a glass of wine with you Sunday. Very much. Thank you. Let's see. Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them to, the to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give, give him thanks and praise. praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. 
We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give yes, us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Our prayer of thanksgiving is found in your bulletin or on your video. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of every good gift, all that we have and all that we are comes from you. Accept the humble gifts of who we are with our differences, our goodness, and our mistakes. Help us to be the blessing of others that you are to us. Help us not to fear, but to love fearlessly. Help us not to worry, but to get busy and help. We ask you to remind us in our hearts and minds of the great needs of so many in the world today for love, truth, and clarity. Keep the clouds of darkness and confusion away as we work to make the world a better place. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who guides, defends, and leads us into all truth. Amen. Amen. May the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, stream within us. May the breath of God renew us. May the breath of God invigorate us. And may we walk with confidence into this new day. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen. Stand up for Jesus.